It is a delight to be able to spend this time together here with you, and we are in kind of a little in-between time right now as we roll our way through the Christmas, New Year holidays, and next week we have our college students back on campus. This week we started our school system back in school, and so next week, by the way, next week we are beginning a new sermon series called Steps as we trace the footsteps of Paul through the book of Romans. I am really looking forward to that today. Discover, and we have uh, something important that we want to do. It's just at the front end, right at the beginning of this particular time right now. Um, some of you, if you're here just a little bit early and you're watching the slide deck loop through uh, before the services, you'll, you'll notice or afterwards that we have published a list of all of our church leaders since this last December. Every year we kind of reaffirm with our leaders whether they're willing to serve given all that we are doing. There's so much that goes on in this church. And then this particular Sabbath, at the beginning of January, we set aside some time to dedicate our elders, deacons, and deaconesses. And uh, quite a number of you are here, and we're glad of that. Some were at the first service here at 9 o'clock. Others I know, and we've kind of shifted a little bit how we're going to do this because we know that some are at home sick or at home quarantining or maybe feel it's a little, a little uh, more than what they ought to be doing to come out today, but we're so glad for all of you who are here. We're going to kind of shift it just a little bit in terms of how we do this, but as we get started, it struck me maybe it would be reasonable, maybe it would be helpful as we get started to just talk a little bit about what this is. You know, I'm a firm believer in this simple statement, sooner or later, everything rises and falls on leadership. And there's a lot that's going on here in this church family, in this community, and many of you, God has called to leadership, and we're going to spend a little bit of time taking a look at that in our study time, and you might be thinking, well, but I'm not an elder, a deacon, or a deaconess. Well, maybe you will be, maybe you ought to be, and whatever it is that you are here thinking you are about, when Jesus Christ calls you, he calls you to come and give your life to him, lay it down, and then take up a cross and follow him. And so he has called you to leadership. If you're a, if you're a young lady, a, a girl, or a boy in this congregation, I hope that this will mean something to you, because God is calling you into leadership. If you're uh, maybe somebody who's just always felt a little bit too busy, I think God is calling you. Maybe you're one of our church members here who would describe themselves as over some hill or another. Maybe that means you're in a perfect place right now to yield to the call of Christ in leadership. One way or the other, I think this is going to matter and mean something to you. You might not know even where the concepts of elder, deacon, and deaconess come from. They're scattered through scripture, but those are our words for words that were actually, uh, we read about in Greek, turned into English. I'll share a couple of those with you. Um, in Acts chapter 6, do you remember what happened in Acts chapter 5? Pentecost came and there was this influx, a rush of new believers and followers of Christ at the day of Pentecost. And so there were, there were a lot of things that were going on. There was a great number of believers that needed to be cared for. And so the apostles were trying to figure out what to do, and they, they decided they would set aside leaders that they called, well, we call them deacons. You know, here, seven were set aside in Acts 6, verse 3. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we'll turn this responsibility over to them. What responsibility? Well, they were caring for the widows and so forth. I, I just want to make mention. If you're ever in this building for something, chances are deacons and deaconesses somehow have been a bit involved. Yeah, you have somebody in your family that whenever anything good happens, you know they were involved. They might not have been out front, they might have been back behind the scenes somewhere, but their fingerprints are all over it. When you come in these doors, when you're greeted, when there's heat in this place, when your Sabbath school classroom is unlocked, when, 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 you can know deacons and deaconesses are involved. Well, but what about deaconesses? Is it just deacons or are there, okay, so females, deaconesses, 
Well, interestingly, Romans chapter 16 tells us a little bit about this. In fact, it's the same word that's used, which deacon or deaconess, the Greek word actually could be translated servant. Servant. Those people, in a few minutes, that we invite to stand among us, those that we dedicate in prayer today, they have said, yes, I am willing to be a servant for the church, to serve. In the 16th chapter, it says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant, a deacon, a deaconess of the church in Centria. In fact, the the Bible doesn't actually kind of... um, worry about gender in this kind of way some churches have taken to calling it calling it the deaconate (laughs) rather than having deaconess and deacon so we know on the basis of scripture that it's not only about proclaiming the gospel to those who've never heard but it's also about being a part of the family of God taking care of one another of the ministries of God. And so we have quite a number of deacons and deaconesses that have said yes. Well, there's also the term elder. This comes, it's used in a a variety of ways, a few different Greek words we're going to take a look at in our study a little bit later. But Philippians chapter 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi together with the overseers and the deacons. The overseers, these are, in fact, another word for elders. Uh, Frankly, shepherds, pastors, elders, those words are fairly interchangeable in the New Testament. There isn't this clear demarcation, okay, you're paid, you're the paid preacher, You're an elder in our church, but rather, elders are set aside as shepherds. One of the differences, if you're wondering, in scripture between elders and the deaconate is these servants, as deacons and deaconesses, as elders, they're given the additional task of teaching and of reaching out to those members of the family of God who find themselves at distance, whether it be they need a visit in the home, um, in the workplace. Pastor Tim and I were talking earlier, and uh, we have a dream that every member of our church, every year, we would be in some form of pastoral contact with. Face-to-face, oh, we hope, Voice to voice for sure, some sort of interaction. That's very difficult to do in this, this size church. Well, one of the things that Pastor Tim is leading right now is, a, is something he's calling the network. It's a network of elders that will each take about 10 people that will be kind of their little flock that they're shepherding, checking in with, touching base with, just seeing how are you doing. And I got to tell you, our church could use more elders for that purpose. If you believe maybe God has put it on your heart to be one of those individuals that, that helps shepherd people, that helps reach out to the people of God, we would love it if you would just, you can, you can send a little email to our, to our church email address or give a call to the office or talk to Pastor Tim or myself. We'd love that. You know, in Acts chapter 14, <clears throat> um, A little story is told here. Paul and Barnabas says they appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. In a few minutes, that's what we're basically going to do is we're going to commit these men and women to God for this year in our dedication service. I think it's fascinating. This word appointed, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders that, that word in the Greek could be more literally translated, they, they raise the hand. It's kind of a weird expression. They raise the hand to these elders for them in each church, and the, the uplifting of hand is kind of the translation of this. But it's not like, it's not like kind of this and prayerful. It's not, it's not like this and praise. It's actually a term that was found most regularly used in the, uh, in the Athenian uh, legislature. The lifting of hand was to vote. And you might know, 
With regularity, historically, the church has taken moments to say, we lift the hand, we say yes, these are people we have set aside, we agree, these are servants who have said yes, these are our shepherds who have said yes. And so that's what we're going to do now. Now we've chosen to, in, by and large, ask our elders, deacons, and deaconesses to just stay in their seats, but um, I've asked that our head elder, John Appel, if he wouldn't mind coming and standing and in a moment kneeling, I'd also like to ask, and we've decided not to have everybody come forward just to minimize the crowding together because of what all is going on in our community right now. God honors this in a wide variety of ways, and I know that there are some people that are at home and are watching from home as we dedicate you. We're glad of it in any of those possible ways. I'm going to ask this too, if the pastors, I see at least three or four of them that are here at this worship service, if you wouldn't come forward, the, those of us on our pastoral staff, Pastor Melody I see, and Pastor Tim, and Litch, and Pastor Horton, come on, come on up, and uh, ap apologies, John, that you get to be our guinea pig today, <laughs> as, see, em emblematically, as we also interact with those of you uh, that are in our congregation um, as we dedicate this year under the leadership God has set aside, as those pastors come forward and as we surround uh, John, I would like to ask for a couple of groups to stand. If you are a deacon or a deaconess in our church, part of the deaconate, would you mind standing right now? Deacons and deaconesses. Yes, I see some of them. Now, by the way, so many, many, many of them are out moving about. Some of them will be back in here to help dismiss and all sorts of individuals. But you see some of the individuals that are here. We have a range of individuals uh, that are serving around the church right now. If you're one of our elders that is at this service, would you mind standing with us right now? Thank you for standing, our elders. Yes. And you may, you might look around and you'll see somebody that you know, maybe somebody who's seated near you that, or that you haven't ever interacted with and uh, just reach out a little later today as you're going, uh, going back, maybe say thank you, ask a question if you'd like, and surely if you were saying to them, boy, I wonder how could I get involved more, well, that they would love to hear too. Uh, but right now, what I'm going to ask and John, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask that each of our elders, deacons, and deaconesses, if you would kneel right now, if you would kneel, and then I'll invite the pastors to just kind of come around John here as we pray a prayer of dedication for our leadership. Lord God, thank you, thank you. We could go around the room naming names, pointing out the characteristics, the experiences, the love the character of these men and women who have said yes to leading in our congregation, thank you, thank you. Right now, and I invite you from your seat or at home, wherever you are, to do as Paul and Barnabas did, and that is to raise your hand and say, yes, these, I thank you, Lord God, for these leaders in my life, by the raising of hands. Lord, we pray over these leaders there's much that I believe you want to do this year. Thank you for giving us strong leadership. Thank you for stirring others who are yet to step up. But we dedicate these, our elders, deacons, and deaconesses today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. Amen. Thank you, John. So today, recover, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about leadership, talking about shepherding, talking about actually the life of Peter. Uh, it strikes me that while there could be somebody who is home because they are sick or uh, quarantining, uh, the vast majority of what we re really need to recover from is not uh, physical illness, but rather that which is impeding the progress that God would have for us. And I want to suggest to you that God has a plan and you are at the center of that plan. You might be wondering, well, but wait, um, you know, I mean, I'm not a, 
a part of the, of the leadership of this church. Again, I would, I would underscore it. There is no one who is a follower of Christ who is outside the language and the calling of leadership. Period. Don't give yourself some easy, flimsy excuse. In fact, Jesus will say it. I've given every one of you something to invest in my work. And the one who he says, you know what, you're not actually even a part of my kingdom, is the one who buries that. Thank goodness we have the opportunity, no matter how things have gone in the past, we have the opportunity to step into God's calling. It might be a formal position, but often it isn't as formal. But these words, whether you're a child in our midst, whether you have um, resisted regularly the call to leadership. I regularly hear somebody share an experience where they've come to this church in part because it is so large and they feel like they can get a little bit lost and that's comfortable. Well, we don't want that to be terribly comfortable. And in fact, I think Jesus this morning wants to make that uncomfortable. Wants to call you into action for him. Maybe you are somebody who feels like you don't want to have what it takes. Maybe you have been a leader in the past and you made some severe mistakes and uh, you, I mean, you, that disqualifies you or so you think. I want to suggest to you that God has a calling for your life as we come into the scriptures today. I want to invite you to turn to 1 Peter 5. As you do, I just want to say one other thing. And if you're a guest, welcome. You don't need to particularly pay attention to this. But I know our members, those that are regularly a part of this family, you would maybe have a curiosity about this because the finances of our mission and ministry through the course of December always become so spine-tingling. Because there's a lot of giving that happens in December. And so for those in our church who lead through the management of finances, it gets a little tense. And you might even hear it in a voice or see it in a face a time or two as in December um, we're challenged to remember the ministries of God in our giving. And so it's always in January and, and God without fail provides. And I just want you to know that he do, has done so again through the giving of his faithful family that we've been able to meet our, our financial budget and um, all of our uh, targets. And, and, and again, it's, it's miraculous at times like this. And we praise God. And I would want you to know to praise God as you pray, as you and possibly you'll be coming tonight. We're into day four, Pastor Melody. I think it's day four of our 10 days of prayer at 7 o'clock this evening. We'll be right back here. If you would like to come and join us, we would be so delighted. Many of you or some of you have been, and, and it is a, a real special time. First Peter chapter 5, this is the writing of Peter. And if, if we were to talk about leaders in Scripture, especially the New Testament, you might single out somebody like John. John was, uh, I mean, goodness, he, 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 he didn't even die as a martyr, even though they would have tried to. Wrote the book of Revelation. Of course, some wonderful letters, the book of, the book of John. You could talk about Paul, and we're going to start studying the life of Paul a little bit and, and the words of the book of Romans next week. Paul would be, of course, an amazing leader in the Christian movement. But Peter, also a fascinating figure from the beginnings of the story of the gospel of Jesus. And in through the New Testament, a fascinating figure, a fascinating character. Here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, he says this, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. This, this Peter, is, by the way, there isn't a lot of differentiation between a local church elder in Scripture, a church elder, and a pastor. In fact, we're going to see in these words that, in fact, these are pretty interchangeable. Today, we have set aside some in the profession, kind of modeling after the priesthood a little bit of the Old Testament these elders, shepherds, pastors. But this word in the first verse of 1 Peter 5 is actually the word in Greek, presbyteros. Presbyteros, you might be familiar with the sound of that word. This is the, the authority and role of, of leadership, that, that the responsibility is being placed on these individuals. And then he goes on to say, be shepherds. That's the word poimen, 
shepherds. Jesus is described as the good shepherd. A little later, a couple of verses from now, Peter will refer to Jesus. He will imply Jesus by calling out the chief shepherd. But here he says, be shepherds of God's flock. It's not about the authority. This is about the, this is about the ministry and this calling to serve the needs of people. To feed to, to lead, to model the way, to be present for. It's this same word that we would use now, the word pastor, pastor pastoral. It is, of course, from this whole shepherding motif. So be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. That is a completely different Greek word, episkopos. Yeah, again, you, you're familiar with the sound of some of these words. These are all referring to elders, not because you must, but because you are willing. And I'm going to suggest to you right there that this is a primary facet of being a leader in the cause and call of Christ. The difference is not necessarily that you can speak more eloquently than somebody else. It's not that you know more than another person has to do with a heart of willingness and listening to the call of God, a desire and a passion for his work and his people. Not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, not eager to, but eager to serve, eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And again, backing up that one verse, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. This is Peter writing, so that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And I'm just going to suggest to you that for Peter to be able to write those words that you would be an example to the flock, that when the chief shepherd arrives, you will share in his glory, he has had to go through a recovery. I'm going to suggest to you. As you know, things have gone wildly wrong in the life of this particular leader. And I think it is a pattern and a, an example to us that might help you and me understand our leadership calling, whether you've ever said yes to it or not. And so we dive in to this recovery. Would you bow your head, Lord God, please usher in your spirit to our hearts. We are open to you. Speak to us through the words of scripture. In Jesus we ask it. Amen. And amen. I'm going to guide you to the book of John, the last chapter. The very last story in the book of John, chapter 21. Now, John, written by John, well, he won't actually refer to himself that way. You know how he refers to himself. He refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, which feels like a little bit arrogant, does it not? I used, uh, you know, I have an older brother, a younger sister, and with regularity, I would like to slip into conversation when my mom was around because I knew, <laughs> I knew how this would go. Well, of course, I'm your favorite. And uh, put her in that awkward place of somehow trying to shift out of that moment. Well, I knew how much she loved all of us, and it was never a particular threat, but wow, to, to sign all of my notes to her, uh, or, worse yet, how about my notes to my brother? Uh, yeah, Dave or mom's favorite. Or how about this? Dave, the son mom loves. <laughs> the disciple Jesus loved. Of course, if you dig a little bit into the Greek and you notice some of the language in the Greek, you're able to pull apart and actually understand, not quite so arrogant sounding is it, if you were to translate it this way, the disciple Jesus kept on loving. And hidden in that little phrase is an admission. I've blown it. I can't even explain it. But he loves me. So rather than using my name, John, I'm just going to, every time I put myself in the story, I think I'll just say, he loves me. I can't explain it. 
but he loves me. Well, John shares this final story, which he is in, but it centers around somebody else. In the third verse, you read, I'm going to fish, Simon Peter tells them. And they say, well, we'll go with you. So what has been happening, Jesus has died. He's risen from the grave, and they're in this kind of in-between world time of the mind-blowing reality that all is not lost. They had seen this all going a very different way, but now it's like, uh, uh, who, I, you, what do we say? What do we do? Uh, we're waiting, but I, they're filled with joy, but maybe more than anyone else, Peter has a bit of an ache in his gut because of how all of this went down. And he doesn't really know what to do. When you don't know what to do, habit kicks in. You go to those comforting places. You might go to a comfort food. You might put on your favorite slippers. You might, I don't know what happens to you when you're stuck and you don't know what to do, but Peter decided to go out in a boat and fish. And the other disciples, many of them fishermen, said, we'll go with you. And so they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And boy, is this, this, this is really, this paints the picture for Peter. Peter, I, I don't, it would almost be like being on a team or associated with a sports team as they win the championship, but having done something right in the but, you know, maybe we'll call it go football. The Super Bowl run that causes them to think, maybe I'm not even on the team anymore. I've blown it. I didn't show up for the game. I don't know where I'm even at. So let me go back to doing what I'm an expert at. And he goes fishing and can't even catch fish. The one thing he knew he could do. About that time somebody shows up in the story, a mystery guest that you know. Early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not realize that it was in fact Jesus and he called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? This Jesus, he's got a sly, sometimes you might even call it a wicked sense of humor. He called out to them, friends, uh, how's the fishing going? Do you have any fish? In fact, wait, what? You've caught no fish? No. No, they answered, we have not. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. I know. You've probably been waiting for a guy calling out from the shore to help you get this figured out. I think what you ought to do. And if you're thinking, wait, this sounds familiar so were they, because indeed this had happened in a way before. Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some there. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish and then the disciple Jesus kept loving said to Peter, it's the Lord, duh. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he did what he often tends to do. That is, jump. He dives into the water after wrapping his outer garment around him. The other disciples followed in the boat, <laughs> towing the net full of fish. Apparently Peter races to shore first, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And isn't this awesome? Because Jesus could do the whole fish breakfast thing absolutely on his own without them. But even though he has fish that are frying in the fire, he says to them, bring some of yours. If you believe Jesus can do this all on his own, you are correct. But if you think that's what he wants to do, you are wrong. Every time, in every version of the telling of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it turns back to this moment when he says, can I have some of the fish? 
out of your hands. I wonder if maybe for some of us we have not been engaged deeply in leadership in God's calling in part because we're pretty attached to our fish. Maybe if we would just think, maybe if we would scroll back, we would realize we don't have any of these fish without Jesus. Maybe there's some part of you, your best talent that you're withholding, you're giving it to something else, you're giving it to your career but not to Jesus. Jesus doesn't t- ask you not to give it to your career, but he says, give me, give me some of your fish. Yeah, oh, I know, I know, I've got good fish. I know, I, I make the best fish. I realize I don't need your fish. I think you need me to have your fish. Giving your fish to Jesus isn't so that he can live, it is so that you can. Give me your fish, Peter. Give me your fish, disciple, I keep on loving. Well, Peter climbs aboard and drags out the net. It's full of large fish, 153. They were so astonished they decided to let count them. Matthew was probably there to help. But even with so many, the net was not even torn. And Jesus says to them, come, have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And they're believing. They're believing. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And of course, there are quite a, a range of conversations, commentaries under, who, who are these? Do you love me more than these? Is he pointing to the other disciples? Do you love me more than these? By the way, in a minute, we're going to notice how interesting that would be because Peter has made the claim before, I love you more than these. I love you in a way they may not. Let's just be honest, you and me, Jesus. Or is it possible that he's turning to the fish? To the nets? Peter, your go-to in this moment is to return to your old life. Do you love me more than your old life? Do you love me more than your career? Do you love me more than your hobbies? Do you love me more than these? Well, this is stinging language, and primarily so because of what Peter has most recently done and said, because Peter is still raw from a moment when he had the chance to say, I love this God man on earth. I am a follower of his, and he didn't. And so it's a little painful when Jesus says, do you you love me more than these? He says, yes, and Jesus says, well, feed my lambs. The second time he turns to Simon Peter and says, Simon, do you truly love me? And he answers, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, Jesus says, take care. No wonder Peter will use the language of the shepherd in 1 Peter chapter 5 as he talks about what it means to lead and to move in this body of Christ. Be shepherds like I am a shepherd. Why am I a shepherd, not a fisherman in my past life? It's because Jesus called me to feed his sheep. The third time, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter, in that moment, was hurt. I think In the future days, he will look back differently on this moment. But in that moment, he is hurt because he keeps asking. And for the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. I'm going to suggest to you that this story is a story of recovery. That it is Jesus convicting the heart of of a leader gone wrong, that you are still welcome as a leader of mine. Maybe somebody here has had a bit of a journey that causes you to feel, no, I'm not a leader. I can't be a leader. I don't have the capabilities of a leader. I'm not, I, I've blown it as a leader. I just, I don't even have the time to be a leader. I'm going to suggest to you there is something in this story for you, whether you've ever stepped up to it or not. 
Now, Peter, as you and I know, Peter was sure of himself. We have different personalities in the room, Horton. Uh, some of us are sure of ourselves. I've learned uh, from the feedback of loving others that I regularly speak in such a way <laughs> that uh, sounds like I know for sure I'm right, even when I, I, don't, I don't realize that's the way I'm sounding. I, a confidence that makes it seem like I don't have any questions, whether I've ever thought about the question I've just been asked or not. You might be that way too, more on the Peter end of the, of the spectrum, sure of themselves, ready to speak out. You remember this story? Jesus, in the book of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has been now ministering for a time and the swirl of commentary about who he must be is going around. Is he, is he Elijah come back from the dead? Is he a version of John the Baptist. Who is this Jesus? And Jesus is asking the disciples, so who do they say that I am? And they repeat some of the common things that are said. And then he turns to them and says, but who do you say I am? And Peter, of course. You know that person in the Sabbath school class that doesn't even let the question get all the way out? And boom, they're ready. That's, he's ready. Peter's ready. And he has something profound and amazing to say. He says, look, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus pronounces him blessed for having said so. And goes on. Goes on to teach them in ways that he hadn't been fully doing in the past. Or certainly not in the broad crowds. And he shares with them the plan of salvation in part includes that I am going to die for mankind. And he's sharing this with the disciples, and then this happens. Check this out, and what I encourage you to do is read this not as we read the Bible typically, which is kind of flat-voiced and a little brain-dead, but actually think about what you're hearing. See what you're hearing here. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Okay. I mean, think about how Peter toward the end of his life, would tell this story. So, I pulled the creator of all things aside, and I said, oh great Jehovah, I said, don't you ever talk like that. <laughs> That's what I told God. I rebuked him. The one who calmed the wind and the waves in front of my very eyes and under my feet. The one who healed the lame, raised Lazarus from the dead, raised himself from the grave. I told him to shut up. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking, Jesus. You don't know what you're saying. Let me give you some cliff notes of how this should go, and then maybe you could put that into action. No, don't say these things. And in that moment, it says that Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And you may think that like, like he's staring over Peter's shoulder because he can see the, the, the spiritual world, and he's pointing at Satan, and it looks a little bit like he's in direct line with Peter. He's talking to This says, he says to Peter, you are being used by the devil. I wonder if there's anybody in the name of good leadership who's been used by the devil. Impediment to leadership number one. Our pride, our ego, our arrogance. Peter's sense that he knew better than Jesus was getting in the way of the mission to save the world. <laughs> Get thee behind me. Get away with that action. But you know the end of the story in John 21, so don't forget it. Because Peter was routinely arrogant. Peter was routinely full of himself. Peter was routinely impetuous and Jesus asked him to lead. Not before any of this, after. 
There's a promise in it for those of us that have more rough exteriors, those of us who are type A, so to speak, those of us who like to tell other people what the real truth is, those of us who sometimes allow ourselves to get in the way of even the gospel ministry that Jesus says to you and to me, look, turn this impediment over to me and I can make you a fisher of men, I can make you a shepherd of the people. Sometime later, you know it, right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, they're having this Passover meal turned Lord's Supper. And as it is drawing to a close, Jesus says this. He turns to them and he says, this very night, you just need to know it, you all around here, all of us in this private and amazing moment, and you might be wondering what I've just said about Judas betraying me, but I'm going to say this to you, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. Well, what is that, what is that elicit? In a Peter type. No, 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 no. Look, I realize, Jesus, why you would say that. I've been looking around the room too. And so I get it. I get it. I get what you're dealing with here. But I, I will never fall away on account of you. I wonder how many times... The God of the universe shakes his head at what you say. At the posture I take. I tell you the truth, Jesus answers. Peter, let me look at you squarely in the eye. You. Telling you the truth, you're going to tonight disown me. And while you disown me, you won't even be recognizing it. But when the rooster crows, remember I said this to you. So what does Peter do? Does he go a little quiet? Does he at least take a little more humble posture? He says, look, 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 no. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Ever. You could measure the time between that leaving his lips and his actual disowning of Jesus in seconds. <laughs> in fact, he's in a garden area or at least a courtyard area of the high priest that Jesus has been taken to his place as he is under trial. And there's a courtyard area a little bit out in the in the outer courtyard area where you can still see and you can hear. And Peter has, he's already tried, his, his grand move of protection, his bold claims was to flash some steel and swipe off an ear, which Jesus turns to him and says, look, put the sword away, and he heals Peter's mistake. And Peter is following after Jesus, but he doesn't know what to do, everything that had been a part of his plan seemed to be out the window and people begin to ask him, hey, wait, I recognize you. Aren't you a part of that guy's group? No. What? Huh? I don't know why you would say that. Why would you say that? Are you saying that to me? Are you talking to me? A while later, somebody says, yeah, I, I recognize this guy. No, you, if you look, it's, it's, it's dark in here. It's the flickering flames of the firelight. See, look again. It's not me. Let me throw a little language in there that you know he wouldn't approve of. About an hour after that, someone asserts, certainly this guy, he is with him, for he is a Galilean. I can hear it in his dialect, in his accent. Peter replies, man, I I do not know what your deal is. But I do not know this man. And about that time, he hears a rooster crow. And he turns to where they hold Jesus. And he catches the eyes of the Savior. You may have been able to hide your failure from everybody else. 
but in the quiet moments, in the darkness when you place your head on the pillow, hauntingly, you know what only Jesus knows. Amazing that it is after this that Jesus says, I've hand-picked you. Maybe it is that for some of us, we aren't even ready for leadership until we have felt the crush of failure, of dropping the ball, of Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him, and before the rooster crows three times, you will disown me. Before the rooster crows today, you'll disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. And I think when, the, when, when John writes that he wept bitterly, what he is trying to say is he was inconsolable. We tried talking to him. Days went by, and all you had to do was say the name Jesus, and he flooded with tears. And the resurrection of Jesus... Amazing. Because he used to know exactly his, kind of where he was on this team. He was at the forefront of this whole thing. He had been with two others invited to this place, a mount of transfiguration where he sees prophets of old in conversation with Christ. He's got a sense. He is upwardly mobile. Things are happening for him. And then this And he knows, he he locked eyes with Jesus in that moment. He knows, he knows. Do you wonder how Peter felt the night Jesus walks through walls as the risen Savior? How's this going to go? It's possible that you have blown it. It's quite likely, actually, that you have not lived up to all Jesus would call you to. And you might be able to hide it from others, but you know Jesus knows, and in your heart of hearts, uh, some of us, we don't come to communion because of it. Some of us stop coming to church because of it. Others of us say, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not worthy, I'm not the right person for leadership, you should probably go find somebody else. And you, by the way, are right. As am I. We will not conclude our story in the midst of Peter's weeping. We will walk with him to a boat, dive with him into the water, pull with him nets straining because of fish Jesus let us think we caught. And taste the breakfast he has made for us and hear his words now, now, please, please lead my people. Peter struggles under this second impediment. Impediment number one is our ego. About the time that gets huge, we fail, and it crashes everything to the ground, and then that's the impediment. I have failed too often. I've failed too publicly. I've failed in ways that maybe nobody else knows, but it just stops me. Somebody here, I promise you, somebody in this room has, is not stepping up into a calling of God because of something they've done in the past, and you deserve, you need the forgiveness of Jesus and to hear the Master's voice say, if you love me, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. So that morning he goes out and he's still in the quandary, still unclear of what his role even might be. And he goes out to do the one thing that he should be able to do. He thinks it's the one thing that's his expertise and he can't even do that right. And somebody here, somebody here is actually stuck on impediment number three, that you are inadequate, that you don't know enough, that you haven't brushed up on everything, that there's a question you could be asked that you don't know the answer to. Anybody here who's got it all sorted out and knows all the answers, go ahead, raise your hand for us so that we can cast you out of the midst of us. (laughs) No, Um. (laughs) 
When we feel we know the answers, we stop needing to walk hand in hand with Jesus. When we're clear that we don't, he is patient and calls us even in that moment. I, uh, in my sophomore year of high school, we had transitioned from Ozark Academy to Blue Mountain Academy. You've heard me talk about it in the past. I, I'm walking the halls the very first week at Blue Mountain Academy, and I'm feeling a little insecure. I'm the new guy, new kid. I feel gangly and thin because, ironically, I was gangly and thin wasn't sure how this was all going to go. You know, it's hard to start talking to people for the first time and all of that. And about this point, somewhere in that first week, Mr. Edison, the music teacher who led band and symphony, and uh, he also, there was a small touring band of uh, musicians that got to do all kinds of great travel and this sort of thing. He, he taught all of those, taught some music lessons, and he came to me and he, t he tapped me on the shoulder as I'm kind of rushing through the hall and he said, hey, Dave, good to meet you, Dave. Do I understand correctly you play the trumpet? Yeah? Well, I'd like for you to try out for the small touring band. I can tell you what immediately went through my head was, how bad has it gotten around here? I was a pretty new trumpet player. I, I was not good. I, I was a, a good sight reader of music, but if some of you know brass, brass instruments, the armature, you've got to build that dude up. And the trumpet is often featured at some point in every single musical number that trumpets are involved in. Come to find out, he was looking for a first chair, first trumpet player. <laughs> which ended up being me by the end of that week. And there had been no miracle. It was awful. I was the first chair, first, I was the first trumpeter. The second trumpeter was another sophomore who had not been in this group the year before either. The next, the third trumpeter was a freshman. We were terrible. And I don't mind telling you, that group could only play whatever we could play. There, were, there was musical number after musical number that we had to discard and could not actually use because the trumpet section couldn't play it. And by the way, the first trumpeter is usually playing the highest parts, the hardest to reach when you've got very little lip. <laughs> it was awful. I hated the idea that we were holding everybody back. I don't know what was going through the heart of Peter. Maybe at this point he was over some of his arrogance. Maybe at this point he's still struggling with a sense of failure. Maybe at this point he's not so sure he's the right person because of his inadequacies. I don't know what message has gone through his mind, but through the course of it, Jesus calls him. He supplies fish. Do you remember Peter dives into the water to swim? I wonder, because that's kind of his move. When Jesus shows up in a story where Peter's in a boat, often Peter ends up outside of the boat. Does it flash back into his memory that particular night when they had started across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus had stayed back, and in the midst of a storm, they see a figure who goes there. They're freaking out, and Jesus says, well, duh, it's me. And Peter says, well, if it truly is you, let me come out on the water with you. Call me out there if it's you. Which you could have written it this way. If it's definitely not you, call me out on the water to drown. Strange that Peter has this kind of perspective. If it's you, call me out on the water. And Jesus says, come. Peter slides over the gunnels, or I don't know, I'm not really boat fluent, onto the water. And as he begins to walk successfully, on the water, me and Jesus. And I don't know if the arrogance kicks in as he turns and looks at the other doofuses in the boat. Maybe a wave catches him just right and he loses confidence and fear sweeps over him. But in a moment, this, this I mean, superstar activity, he's swirling to the bottom. I don't know where you're at in your life if you've 
If you've even maybe taken on something and it was going pretty well and then suddenly disaster hits. In terms of your spiritual journey, just know this, as the story goes, Jesus is there. Jesus cares. Jesus called him onto the water. And it doesn't matter that he lost focus. It doesn't matter that the wind has blown him over. It doesn't matter if he even got full of himself. In the moment he is gurgling to the bottom, he calls out Jesus' name and he reaches out wherever you are, however far you have fallen. Jesus' arm is long enough to reach you. Don't leave this room lost and alone. Call out his name. He pulls you up. I wonder if on that John chapter 21 story day, if there's a little bit of a flashback to that moment that happens next. Let me tell you how it doesn't go in the story of Peter walking on the water. That Jesus, who has clasped the hand of the drowning Peter, lifts him up into the air above the wind and the waves and slam into the boat. It doesn't say it overtly. It says it, though, in ways we can understand that, in fact, he pulls Peter up onto the surface of the water. Matthew chapter 14 says, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. And when they climbed back into the boat, time passes. What happens during that time that passes is that Jesus and Peter are walking again on the water. Here's the amazing truth. Even though he failed, even though he's not capable, even though maybe he even got arrogant in that moment, Jesus pulls him to the surface and says, come walk with me. Just like John 21, he says, yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to say this to you three times. You'll get it later why I've picked three. For every time you denied me, I'm going to let you say out loud again, I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Shepherd. Shepherd the people. In fact, Jesus has been on this recovery mission for a little while. Do you remember his words when he is discovered by a woman in this garden just after he has risen from the dead? He says, go back and tell the disciples and Peter. In fact, go back and tell the disciples. And would you mention to Peter that I asked about him by name? You'll find him weeping. I don't know who you think you are in the story of Jesus but I do know who he thinks you are he thinks you are a shepherd he thinks you are called he believes in you there's an amazing thing that happens when somebody believes in you isn't it true I don't know why Mr. Edison decided to believe in me I kind of think it's because he was stuck I was the best of some very severely bad options But that belief did something in me. I couldn't help myself. Of course, I by that point was in band and in symphony and in this particular touring group. And uh, I was the first chair in all of them. And we were awful, but I was putting in the time. And he believed in me. And so I just kept working. I just kept working it. And it was awful one day. And it was awful. And then it got to be not terrible. And then by the end of the year, my sophomore year, by the end of the year, my sophomore year, They stopped having to tailor music simply around whether the trumpet section could play it or not. And do you know that by my junior year, we were the best section in that group? Some of you would know, I think it's Dr. Pat Silver, who is a musician here. She was asked to go to the Columbia Union and lead a big band festival. And there must have been 25, 30 trumpeters in this festival. And... They asked me, would you be the first chair, first trumpeter? I'd never, ever, ever, ever been able to do that except for the kind of lunacy of Mr. Edison. It's lunacy that Jesus sees you, believes in you, And it does not matter if you are a young girl, if you are an old man, Jesus sees you, and whatever your excuse, Jesus would say, ah, perfect. 
if you will, if you will, if you are willing, I've got something I want to do with you. Will you feed my sheep? Will you be about more than just yourself? Will you serve? Will you be a servant? Will you lead? Lord God, thank you for your unmatched grace, for your willingness, insistence even, to exercise your plan in the hands of men and women who are flawed, who are arrogant, who have failed, who are not capable. Thank you for always coming alongside of us and saying, hey, hey, what do you have there? Is that a fish? Do you mind if I have your fish? So today, Lord Jesus, whatever we have, we turn to you and we say, yes. Rescue us, yes. Save us, yes but call us to something big and important in your name, yes. So bless this, your family in Jesus. Amen. Amen, and a happy Sabbath to you. As we close today, I'm going to come down and I'm going to be dismissing, but you are also very welcome to stay right in your seats. If you'd like to just listen to our praise team as they lead another song, either way is fine. Happy Sabbath to you.